Nah, I don't need much. Good afternoon, everybody. Hello, hello. Welcome to the afternoon of day one. Hey, Mike. Um, <laughs> Uh, day one of the Open SUNY Coat Summit. Hi to everyone who's tuning in virtually. Um, the hashtag, in case you don't remember from this morning, is um, Coat Summit. And so if you have any questions for the presenters um, virtually or even for, the, for those of you in the room, um, I want to encourage you to, to um, tweet it with the, with the hashtag Coat Summit. Um, this afternoon, uh, we have an amazing program that is uh, starting off with uh, Kyle Peck, um, who is here today um, from uh, sunny Pennsylvania, um, <laughs> and uh, Kyle is the professor uh, is a professor of education at Penn State University, and he's also co-director of the Center for Online Innovation and Learning um, with one of my friends, Larry Reagan, and I think there's a couple of others, but um, mm -hmm. um, we uh, have lots of friends at Penn State, and I am thrilled to have you here. Um, uh, to uh, talk to us about rethinking higher education in the age of nomad. And um, I just want to make mention, Dean Dyer's not here, uh, but Dean was a student of Kyle's and a couple friend. of years ago. And a friend. And a friend. Yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, I think it was not last year, but the year before, um, said, hey, you should really um, you know, Google Kyle Peck, and he would be an awesome presenter for the summit. So I am very pleased to introduce you to my friend now, Kyle Peck. Great. So if it doesn't go well, it's Dean's fault. Let's all remember <laughs> that right now. Dean, are you listening? Yeah, he probably could be. Sorry, Dean. Uh, he will be here tomorrow, so let him have it. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. I, I think it's a, a really interesting and amazing time in the history of education, and I'm really happy to chat with you about it. Other professionals, professional educators who are designing outstanding learning experiences, designing and delivering outstanding learning experiences. Um, can you guess the caption for this cartoon? It's a Gary Larson Farside cartoon. Yeah, any guesses? Oh, did I go? I went right by it. Shoot. Great moments in evolution. In Gary, Gary Larson's mind, this is like how life emerged from the, from the ocean, right? And, and I, I like this slide a lot because, to me, we are, we are there, right? We've been doing things the same way for a long time. We've been in an environment that was created hundreds of years ago, really. You know, sort of the teaching and learning environment was created and hasn't really changed a whole lot, but... We're about to take some steps that are going to bring us into a whole new environment with great possibilities to do great things for learners. So, I mean, I see it as a really uh, optimistic, uh, bright moment for learning and for those of us who are creating learning experiences and delivering them. Different, but outstanding opportunities. They say there are three kinds of people in the world. There are actually two kinds, those who say there are three kinds and those who don't, but there are three kinds. Those who watch things happen, those who make things happen, and those who wonder what happened, right? <laughs> so, so we've been, we, as professionals, we watch what's going on around us, but we also, we're the ones who make these new things happen. And if we don't, the people who aren't really paying attention and think they can just coast and, you know, ride the momentum that the university has had over the past couple of centuries may be in for a surprise. There are big changes outside education and some changes inside education that are really influencing my predictions here. First is, you know, more, better, faster, cheaper, smaller. I'm, I apologize. This is the hardest slide to read of the whole bunch, and you don't really need to. It's on there, so when I give Alex the PDFs, you can, you can read it later. But things like this, the world has become connected. Devices are um, almost ubiquitous, at least in this culture. We're connected. Uh, Facebook went from nothing to something, to, to 600, 845 active users at the end of 11, and it's continued. That, that growth was faster than anything before Facebook. That was, that was the fastest anything had ever spread. You got Twitter, you got Pinterest, you got Ning, you've got online shopping. Why do I care about online shopping? What does that have to do with anything? Well, I'll get to that a little later. Amazon.com, at first it was sort of an experiment. Now it's for real. Amazon.com is where I get most of my stuff, other than groceries. 
And once they have the drones working, maybe that'll happen too. Uh, Etsy, political, different political environment. Econom economies are making and uh, busting and booming at, at cycles that are quicker than before. It's a really different place out there. All those things are affecting us, and they kind of roll together to be this mass customization. In other words, I can get what I want soon. It's pretty much to my specifications. I have good information about the thing, I, the thing I'm ordering, and I can get it delivered to me with my initials on it Thursday. Oh, that's tomorrow. Saturday, if I pay extra for de delivery. Anyway, moving on. Inside higher education, have we had some big changes? What would you say are the big changes? There's one. I gave that one away with a, a misclick. Okay, so benchmarking. That, it's, it's happening. Has it really changed the way we operate to a great extent? Would students notice it? That's one of the, one of the criteria I use for big changes. Would students have students noticed any big changes? They noticed that one. I think one of the biggest changes is the acceptance and use of online learning. If we think about what's really changed in the last decade, a decade ago people didn't think online learning worked. Or you can't teach what I teach through online learning, or online learning isn't as good. And it turns out the research with adult learners shows it's probably even a little better with adult learners. And so that's a big change, I think. I think the fact that the higher and higher percentages of the population are participating, it's not just the top 20%, 25, 40, it's now pretty much everybody's trying to get into college and, and uh, make a future because that degree does make a difference. And we have changes in the typical student. So one of the big things, especially you, uh, in online, it's not, people think of the college student and it's an 18 year old, you know, walking the campus. Well, that's, that's not the majority anymore. And so this is huge. This is, and the potential, the potential there is huge. People like us will be learning for a long time. But we're not necessarily going to register for a degree, right? We have one. We have got that ticket. So if we think about that change and how that we might capitalize on that, especially through online uh, methods, it's a pretty bright future. So why have we had so little change in education? Well, it could be because we got it right the first time. When people, a couple centuries ago, put it together, they nailed it, right? And it works. Or it could be, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Or that there just isn't enough competition to really get us moving forward. That we're just sort of doing what we've been doing. So, how many of you saw the Saturday Night Live 40th anniversary show the other, the other day? Okay, about half. The rest of you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you out. This, this character, I'm about to show you a character that wasn't even on the 40th anniversary, but should have been. I don't know how they missed him. Here we go. But I never liked the school too much, to tell the truth. I find the education, I think it don't matter where you go to school. Italy, America, Brazil, it's all the same. It's all just a memorization. And it don't matter how long you can remember anything just so you can parrot it back for the test. And I got this idea for a school I would like to start. Something called the Five Minute University. <laughs> and the idea is that in five minutes, you learn what the average college graduate remembers five years after he or she's out of the school. <laughs> Would the cost of like $20. <laughs> That might seem like a lot of money, $20 just for five minutes, but that's for like a tuition, <laughs> cap and gown rental, <laughs> graduation picture, snacks, everything, everything included. You know, like in college, you have to take foreign language. Well, at the five minute university, you can have your choice. Any language you want, you can take it. Say if you want to take Spanish, what I teach you is, como esta usted? That means, how are you? And the answer is muy bien, means very well. And believe me, if you took two years of college Spanish, five years after you're out of school, como esta usted muy bien, about all you're going to remember. <laughs> so in my school, that's all you learn. You see, you don't have to waste your time with the conjugations, vocabulary, all that junk. You just forget it anyway, and what's the difference? <laughs> 
Economics, supply and demand. That's it. Business, business is you buy something and you sell it for more. Theology, I'm going to have a theology department, you know, since I'm a priest, it's only right. And what you have to learn in theology is the answer to the question, where is God? And the answer is, God is everywhere. <laughs> Why? Because he likes you. <laughs> That's a kind of a combination of the Disney and Roman Catholic philosophies. <laughs> just, it's just a perfect for the late 70s or early 80s, you know? Just a perfect. Well, after the courses are all over, then it's a time for a little Easter vacation. No time to go to Fort Lauderdale. Only lasts like 20 seconds. But what I do for you, I like to turn on a sun lamp. You know, I give you a little glass of orange juice. That's the snack part, orange juice. And then after vacation, you know, after you swallow it real quick, then it's a time for the final exams. I say to you, como esta usted? You say muy bien. Whereas God, the God is everywhere, economics is supply and demand. Then I put on your cap and a gown. I get out to my Polaroid camera, you know, make a little snap a flash of picture for you. I give you the picture, you give me $20, I give you a diploma, and you're a college graduate, ready to go. And I'm not. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure, right next door to the Five Minute University, I might have opened up a little law school. <laughs> you know, you got another minute? <laughs> okay, so it's funny because it kind of hurts a little bit. Like, it's funny like when somebody falls down, it's funny a little bit, you know? Uh, there's a lot of truth in there. But we all know that's not everything we do. But so what's holding us here? Why, why are we operating in a system that everybody can sort of relate to what just happened? Here's my one minute answer. Because of our traditions, we've kept our balance for many, many years. We have traditions for everything. How to eat, how to sleep, how to wear clothes. You may ask, how did this tradition start? I'll tell you. <laughs> I don't know. But it's a tradition. Okay. So, I think we do a lot of what we do because that's the way we've done it. And I think we do a lot of what we do because that's kind of what people expect us to do. But that's changing. So people's expectations are changing pretty dramatically because of things like online shopping, because of the cost, because of employers' dissatisfaction with some of the product, because, because, because. It's a whole bunch of different things that are coming together to cause us this problem. So it's, it's, a, it's a combination of problems and opportunities to do things another way. Right? It's not just all coming out of dissatisfaction in a negative place, it's coming out of a positive place as well. So I know this audience knows a lot about MOOCs, so I'm not going to go into, go into detail there, but Massive Open Online Courses and Open Educational Resources have a great potential to change the way people learn. How many of you have ever have learned anything on YouTube? Yeah, yeah, right, that's, that's my go-to. If I need to learn how to do X now, I go to YouTube. But there are all kinds of other uh, great learning uh, opportunities out there. 
We also have competency-based education. It's not a new idea, but it's making a real comeback right now. Okay, it's, it's really climbing the, the charts here. That's another opportunity for us, especially in online learning. Right, man. Okay, digital badges. I see as a really nice um, companion to competency-based learning. They kind of drive each other. We'll get into that a little more later. Personalization. There are adaptive learning systems. This is a new name they gave. I wrote, I co-authored the first book on computer-based learning way back. That's how all this gray came about. And uh, you know, we were doing branching paths. If somebody has trouble with this, you take them this way. If they're doing well, you take them that way. Well, there are whole systems that are being developed, mainly for the great big bread and butter courses that you know, we teach to undergraduates to help optimize everybody's path. And, and first of all, make sure everybody can be successful and optimize a path through it. Uh, companies like Newton and Smart Sparrow are in that space. You may have heard about them. Prior learning assessment. Not talking about credit for, for work experience, talking about proving that you learned something and getting credit for that. And then there will be, there are an increasing number of competitors who are willing to reinvent higher education if we don't. I just, uh, somebody just sent me uh, an article that ran in, I think it was Time today online, that said it's a $1.3 trillion industry and venture capitalists are lining up right and left. And uh, if we don't do it, others will. But we're the professionals. We know the industry and we have the design background to really make things right. So wow, this is a pretty amazing time in the history of education. And I really think it's wonderful for us to be here. I'm, I, wouldn't want to, I'd actually like to roll the clock back about to where I'm about your age, so most of your age, so I could have a longer uh, swing at this. But it's really going to be impressive when we put all those things together and say, what can we do now that all of these opportunities exist that we simply couldn't do before? Instead of saying, how do we incorporate this into everything that's there, you know, sort of integrating technology. There's always this argument, integrating technology, whether you sort of evolve evolutionary or revolutionary kinds of approaches. You know, I think we need to start thinking beyond the degree, beyond the course. We can keep those. You know, let's keep those. Let's add some of these new ideas to those, but let's also make them available in revolutionary ways. Uh, I'm sorry I'm going to miss David Wiley tomorrow. Please give him my, uh, give him my regards. Um, I, I remember him first as the learning objects guy. Right? And when he talked about learning objects and how we can take these learning objects and use them and reuse them in many ways. And now as, as you know, one of the leaders in the open education resource movement. But yeah, I mean, we can take these things we build and use them in multiple ways and meet the demand for degrees, which isn't likely to go away anytime soon, but also meet the demand of people who have degrees, who aren't going to go back and get a whole degree. And let's build things that make sense to them. I'll get into that online shopping a little bit later. So spoiler alert, if I haven't already, I'd like to tell you that this is the punchline. Whoops, I, I blew it, here we go. Uh, I think life is gonna be a lot different. And I don't think our primary business in 20 years is gonna be selling degrees. I think we'll still sell some degrees, but it won't necessarily be from people who come here and you know come here or wherever we are or even invest in a four-year continuous kind of a thing. It'll be a degree will be something that people gather the pieces of as they move through life. And we'll be a lot more flexible than we are now. Okay, I, I, I wanna point out that the success that you have caused, oh, rats, the success that you have caused, this is not, not, my, uh, not my own clicker, but it's a great one, but it's much more sensitive than mine. Here we go. Okay, so online learning has changed our thinking. Again, it wasn't very many years ago where people didn't believe in this. And now we've gone from that point to where most people believe that you can learn important things online. And most administrators, I think it was 74% in a survey I saw recently, of institutional leaders believe that a, a strong online learning um, department or uh, aspect is critical to the institution's success. Not just nice to have, but critical. Like if you don't have it, you're going to have trouble in the future. The population of people who want to get into college is growing from 150 million in 2000 to 250 million by 2025. 
People from all over the world want access to higher education. But they can't, they can't pay a Penn State price for it, most of them. I feel really bad about that. But I think combinations of open educational resources, MOOCs, other things, digital badges, small pieces, and allowing people to, to accumulate pieces from a bunch of different sources is what's going to happen. That's where my title comes from. So think about learning in the age of the nomad, that K-N-O-W mad. Nomads wandered the earth sort of looking for food, right? And they would gather hunters and gatherers. And I think with education credentials, that's what's going to happen again. Well, not again, a new kind of nomad. People like us are going to say, oh, for this job I need a leadership credential, a diversity credential, and uh, you know, I need to be certified in network administration. Oh, and teamwork, they value teamwork. And I'm going to say, I need to get a credential in this. And I think we're going to go to an Amazon.com-like marketplace where we're going to say, I need a leadership credential. And just like Amazon.com right now, by the way, they have, a, they have a store for 3D printed products. You think they're not going to have a store for education products? So I'm going to be able to search. I want a leadership badge, a leadership credential. It's going to come back and show me you know, three pages of organizations that are offering leadership badge. But right now, if I say, well, I need an MBA, you get a little bit of information about the MBA, not much at all, really, and you're buying this huge thing. In the future, you're going to be buying a smaller thing, and you're going to have great information. That includes Amazon.com, like you get a little blurb, and click to read more, see some reviews of people who've earned that badge, see some reviews of people who've hired people who had that badge, see how long it's going to take, and maybe like Best Buy, you'll be able to sort of, how long does it take to earn this credential? How much does it cost? You know, maybe equality, and there's, there's an endorsement layer that's going to be there too, so you'll be able to say, who's endorsed this badge? So anyway, it's going to be a very different marketplace that's exciting opportunity for us if we get there. Um, and I think there's going to be another bit of growth in remote participation in synchronous classes. You'll see in a minute, I, as a designer, I'm a believer in the taxonomies of different learning outcomes, and some things are fine in MOOCs, some knowledge level and comprehension level stuff, but the other stuff needs to be done in real-time interaction. But even that can be done from a distance. So, you probably heard the talk about disruptive innovations. Innovations that start out weak. So nobody, everybody looks at them and says, Phew. you know, MOOCs aren't going to change higher education. You know, MOOCs, it's just talking head videos and, uh, you know, quizzes, multiple choice quizzes. That doesn't replace what I do. But disruptive innovations get better fast. And ultimately, they do present a challenge to the incumbent. And that, what I... I propose to you is that we don't just have one disruptive innovation and it's not going to be any one thing. It's not going to be MOOCs or digital badges or competency-based learning or prior learning assessment. It's going to be a combination of those things or, you know, new assessment techniques, uh, uh, you know, computer algorithms that can grade a written page and things like that. It's not going to be any one of those things. It's going to be a combination of those with those other factors in terms of cost and you know, what my expectations are as an online consumer. So here's one example. I mean, these are all things that might be disruptive innovations. I just used Khan Academy as the most familiar of the examples of online, open online educational resources. And then online shopping. I really think that that's changing our expectations for how we buy things and what we know and the kind of information. People aren't going to say, I'm about to buy the biggest, most important thing in my life, other than my house. My education probably costs more than anything else. And I'm doing that on almost no information. And, when I, and if I don't finish, I walk away with almost nothing in terms of actually having that credential. So I think things are going to change pretty dramatically. I think those things together create the perfect storm kind of metaphor. And that there is, because people have said over and over and over again, you know, the, uh, the movie projector is going to change education forever, right? The video disc is going to change education. The, the computer is going to change education forever, and they didn't. But this time, I think, I think, and it's not just me, the CIC, which is the Big Ten, uh, sort of an organization of Big Ten universities, they commissioned a study, and they came back and said, this time it is different. It does appear to be different. This isn't like those other times. There's so many forces together that this time could potentially be very different. Just like online learning's changed our thinking, so have MOOCs. 
So it used to be that we thought, you know, take the world's best courses for free, and we used to think that it was going to be primarily students from Africa and under, underdeveloped nations that were going to take courses. It didn't turn out to be true. Udacity, Sebastian Thrun at one point said there'll only be 25 uh, universities left after 10 years or something like that. That's ch changing. And then edX, too, was saying in this uh, picture, the future of education, um, they were calling MOOCs the future of education. So although I don't think all of that hype was true, and if you, I should probably build in the Gartner Group hype cycle here where every new technology goes up to, oh, everybody's starry-eyed, and then boom, down into a trough of disillusionment, and then climbs out the other side with realistic you know, gains to be made and contributions to be made. Note to self, build it in here, or I'll get it on the recording. Kyle, build that in. With you. Okay. So, but I do think we've learned through MOOCs that there are higher ed institutions ready to give away content. And I know David and Lumen Learning have been, you know, fighting that good fight trying to make that happen. And some institutions are way ahead of others in terms of giving away their academic content. It's proved that we're already seeing tools for peer assessment improve. So when, if we can build online ways for students to support each other, they'll be able to take on challenges that are greater and greater. Think Vygotsky there, right? With support, they can do things they can't necessarily do on their own. But for free, they can't buy expert support. So what can we do to create support that is somewhere in between an expert and none? And those tools are being developed. Um, so in the end, and we also know, especially the online learning crowd, that not, online learning is not for everybody. You have to be sort of a self-regulating, you know, you have some self-discipline. You have to be, for it to work for you, uh, it's not going to work for everybody. But some students certainly can learn what they, you know, will learn what they can learn by themselves and with peer support. And then they're going to want to demonstrate that and say, hey, wait a minute. Don't make me take that class. I know what's in that class. And we tend to say, well, you know, you know, six of these seven modules, but not all seven. So take the class. Oh, and then it's a big 18-week long thing. That's what other commitments do you make that are 18 weeks, let alone four years, six years? You know, that's not the way this population in this country is going to go. <coughs> so when we create ways for them to demonstrate their learning, I mean, real, and this is great. Learning designers, man, we've got our job security is solid, right? Because somebody's got to develop all these good, you know, learning outcomes and the ways to measure that. And, uh, you know, it's going to be a great, a great decade for us. So let's talk a little bit about competency-based education. Here's a good uh, reference for that. It was published by INACOL. Um, and in that they say, yep, in that they say, uh, they define competency-based pathways. Really, these three bullets are the important piece. So students advance, advance based on mastery. In other words, get the clock out of here. It's not necessarily due next week, and you don't have this much time to finish. You, you move forward when you've mastered thing X. And if you're having trouble with thing X, let's get you some other ways to learn it. And then, of course, you have to have explicit measurable learning outcomes for that, and you have to have assessments that really do the job. And sometimes those assessments are going to take expert intervention. But competency-based learning is really coming on. So it's gaining steam. Western Governors University and Southern New Hampshire University are the two that are sort of the poster children now, because they were the first two to apply to the federal government. Well, Western Governors was sort of set up to be that. And then Southern New Hampshire was actually sort of going under as a community college, and then changed to degree completion focus and competency-based approach. And now, both of those institutions that are sort of the flagships of competency-based education are growing at about 30% per year. Why? Because they're providing a service that students want and respect, right? It's flexible, it's personal, it's accessible. And uh, when I went to a conference in Boston uh, two years ago, the U.S. Department of Education was there saying, hey, we sent a letter to all the heads of in institutions saying, Please, you know, come to us and ask for permission to develop competency-based programs rather than ones based on seat time. If you get our permission, then your students can use their federal loans to register for courses even that aren't time-based. So at that point, uh, Southern New Hampshire was in the audience, and they said, we've got one on your desk, and it's been there for two months. 
But, uh, but at that point, there was almost nobody. Last year, there were 20 applications. And this year, so far, there are 250 applications from universities saying we want to, we want to implement competency-based programs. So I call that a trend. Uh, personalized and flex degrees. We have someone here I met her earlier. I'm not good with names from Northern Arizona. Yeah, they have personalized bachelor's degrees. It's not what she's. It's not what she's about. She's in another aspect of it. But places like University of Northern Arizona, University of Wisconsin, serious, you know, formidable forces are moving into this in this direction. And vendors, Pearson, is you know, man, they're drooling. At, at the prospect. They're building the, the mechanisms, the inner infrastructure to support competency-based learning and they're going into badging and they're really trying to, to get in there and, and steal our lunch, if you, if you will. I mean, they want, they want our business. Okay, so that takes us to prior learning assessment. I think we all understand what it is, but what it isn't is just saying, I've already been in the workplace for three years, so give me 90 credits. It doesn't happen. What happens is, you evaluate an, a, a, a legitimate college-level outcome using, you know, we don't care where it comes from. That's the second bullet. And, you know, it has to be the equivalent of a college outcome. And then if, in fact, they can prove to you through an examination or a portfolio or a performance, <clears throat> then you can give them credit, college credits for that. <clears throat> there was one institution in Tennessee. I really shouldn't know it. In fact, I should put that another slide in here. Uh, that does that. They, they had, for $1,200, you can come in and take a battery of tests on one day. And you'll go through a bunch of, like, inbox, it's not inbox exercises, but actual performances you do that are graded by people who are trained in that. They were developed by external, and, and I think the person who did that got something like 30 credits. Which you say, well, $1,200 for one day. Yeah, no, $1,200 for 30 credits. Look at it that way. It's a good deal, and, and it's just the right thing to do, right? Why would we do this? Well, how can I justify making somebody learn something they already know? Make them sit through a class, make them do exercises. That's just not right. I mean, there should be a code of ethics for educators that say, no, we don't make them do that. It, we're, there's a big thing about reducing time to completion of degrees. That would help. And efficiency fills the gaps in the labor market and... Uh, the people who are given prior learning assessment credits do finish at a higher rate. So here's a study that was published uh, by CAEL, which is an organization around CAEL, which is uh, around competency-based learning, where they actually tracked gradu rate, graduation rates of people who did not earn any prior learning assessment credit and those who did. And in every category, the uh, blue is earned associate's degrees, bachelor's degrees is the red, and did not is the top. You can see the, the degree earners in the blue and red is higher when prior learning assessment was awarded. Why? Because you've reduced the time, right? They're already part way there. It's not, it's not rocket science. I think I've already said this. I'm not gonna, I want to get into the discussion, so I'm not going to spend much more time on that. But online shopping is changing our expectations about the way we buy things, the way we engage in things. Nano degrees. This is another, uh, another interesting thing. So Udacity, one of the MOOC companies, has started to call uh, a, what we would call a certificate. Like if you take the five core courses in computer science, you can get a nano degree in computer science. They're not calling it a bachelor's degree. They're calling it a nano degree. So people are already starting to say, move this stuff aside and just get this, which is, I think, a danger. I think you would agree, those of you who value the degrees, I think we need to do something in defense of that kind of approach. So here's another um, look at it. This is an article in the Chronicle saying, uh, people's now buy songs, not albums. All right? And they're making the parallel to us. Are they going to continue to buy degrees, or are they going to buy smaller things? Now, we could argue that, and I hope we will get there, get there soon. But that was an interesting one. They call it the end of the classes we know at claim. And the very notion of class might be outdated. So lots of, lots of people. Projecting. I'm going to borrow the next few slides from my associates at Penn State, Kyle Bowen, who used to be at Purdue. <clears throat> He's the, the most the smartest guy I know in terms of digital badging. And Chris Long, who's our associate dean in undergraduate education. So they put these together <clears throat> to talk about one of the problems we have. That is blurred out because it's an academic transcript. 
right? It's an academic transcript. My friend Kyle Bowen <laughs> sort of stunned me one day when he compared it to a Walmart receipt. He said, look at that. That's, by the way, that's what you get. That's what you get after you spend years and tens of thousands of dollars. You get that. And you get a, a pretty piece of diploma, too. But as far as proving what you know and what you can do, we don't even put, those aren't even full course names behind there. It's intro ed prog or intro ed res, right? We don't even know what that means, let alone whether I was good at, yeah, okay. So I'm talking to the choir here. I like this quote, compared with the new open badge system, standard college transcript looks like a sad and archaic thing. Why? Because it is. You know, the grading, the, the letter grade, that was developed in a paper and pencil wor world. We grade meat, right? We grade eggs. We don't need to grade learning or grade people. That's kind of demeaning. We just need to say what they can do when they've, when they've mastered something, right? Let's move on. Just leave that behind, which takes us to digital badging. So a digital badge, we all kind of know what a badge was, a picture that represents something. But it's more than that now because beneath the skin of a badge, digital badge, it's an electronic image that has metadata behind it. Just like when you click a link on the Internet or somewhere, it takes you somewhere. When you're using digital badges, you click a link and it reveals comprehensive information about that badge, including who issued the badge, who earned the badge, what they had to do to earn the badge. There can be links to the evidence. If the evidence is stored digitally, you can click a link and actually see a video of somebody demonstrating presentation skills. And there's another link called evidence that you can click to see the rubric that was used to evaluate that performance, not filled in, but the rubric that they used to assess that. And there's another, going to be another field in there. Uh, you can tie it to standards. That's another good one, date issued. If, they, if you want them to expire over time, you can set an expiration date. But there's also going to be one for endorsements. So associations, professional associations, universities, companies will be able to put their seal of approval on badges. So this changes things. Because now, if your institution is doing a better job than mine in terms of leadership development, it's going to be clear to the world. Because they're going to click my badge and see, to earn Kyle's badge, all you had to do was read three articles on leadership and write a two-page paper. To earn your badge, they had to do that, and they had to actually lead a team to do something. And the assessment wasn't just from a professor. It was from the uh, team of people that were led, and da, da 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 And all of a sudden, you look better than I do. And ratings, rankings of universities that have taken centuries to build couldn't change very quickly once this starts to happen. <clears throat> because we finally would have an indication of the teaching and learning that really goes on instead of number of books in the library and you know other factors. The SAT scores of people when they come in the door, how does that make me a good school? If I take you know exceptional people and produce exceptional people, it doesn't sound like a good school to me. If I take the rest who've struggled and produce exceptional people, that's a good school. All right, get off that soapbox. Badges can be used in universities in lots of different ways. This is another one of Kyle Bowen's uh, uh, illustrations here. They can be used in curricular and non-curricular and extracurricular activities, co-curricular activities. Clubs can use them. That's the great thing about badges is not only, they're not only for universities. <clears throat> they were developed by the programming community to document some of the undocumented skills that programmers were developing. They learn new programming languages. They teach each other languages. They develop competencies, and they got nothing to show for it. So they develop. That's where the idea came from. But it's true. You know things about photography. You know things about cooking. You know things about uh, interaction, uh, social. Yeah, all those things can be badged and can be curated by you in an online portfolio. I don't think we're going to have time for me to get in and do a hands-on demo, but I'll do that another time for you if you want. <clears throat> you end up with a collection of badges. You can create a collection, a set of collections on the side. And you just drag badges into a new box. And then you title that box. You check public. You click one more link, and it makes a web page with all those badges on it. You copy the URL. You send it to somebody. And somebody now has a web page that has all the badges you wanted to show them ready for display. Boom, they click. They can see your evidence. They see the criteria. It's, it's so much better than that transcript. It's 
It's going to blow us out of the water. So some universities are doing this. University, you see Davis, uh, Colorado State are in, is into it. Purdue was the leader for quite a while. We hope to overtake them. Come out of nowhere, Penn State, with a new badging engine we're building to take them on. Uh, this is a, a glimpse of our liberal arts college is going to be using badges to describe this liberal arts citizen that has uh, four different pieces to it, global perspective, initiative, leadership, and engagement. Inside global perspective, you'll see things like the globalist badge, the culturalist badge, and the traveler badge. Inside excellence in communication, you'll see things like oral presentations, public discourse, so on, so on. That's just the beginning. This is, we haven't really even released the engine. I want <clears throat> to jump now. How am I doing on time? I'm doing well, right? Two, oh, three. Oh, yeah, we're good. We're not great, but we're good. Okay, so uh, Haven Lab, futurist. Uh, he's with the Parthenon Group. He does consulting for universities. He put up this model and sort of talked about stages that we've moved through from new traditional to academic innovation. These are recent stages. And you'll see it starts at the top left with online enhancement to on-ground traditional, then hybrid online, fully online programs, MOOCs, competency-based learning. Notice that these, on the right-hand side, he's calling student-paced models. This is like a new, a new era that we're moving into here. And that in those student-paced models, it's really, he's really labeling that sort of academic innovation. That's the academic innovation side. And in that, it's students completing online courses at their own pace, culminating in online assessment and credentials. Uh, it doesn't have to be, again, some of them, like Western Governors University, they don't care where you learn it, just that you learn it and you finish the assessments. Uh, I'm going to move through this quickly because I want to leave more time. Uh, so we need to act on the changes we see. So these things are happening, and we are the designers of this industry, right? And somebody's going to build the next something. I want it to be us, because we know, uh, we know more. We're better prepared to do that than other people. Our primary business isn't going to be content delivery. It's going to be support, assessment, and certification. All right, we're going to find ways to make students want to come to our organization, because they're going to get the support they need to be successful in the program over at some time frame that makes sense to them. Others want to do that. Uh, I think I covered all that. So the question is, how do we bring all this together? You know, how do we bring all that together? How do we do all these things I just talked about? What's the first step? So it starts as a designer with Bloom's taxonomy, right? We all know this as designers. There are different kinds of learning outcomes. Some are tougher than others. As you move up that scale, it's going to require more expert guidance unless you can rely less on peer support. So what if we took that and said that's the basis on which we're, which we're going to make our decisions? So an advanced course might have you know, learning outcomes from all of those different levels. It might look something like this. An intro course is going to have things from the lower levels, just comprehension and knowledge acquisition levels. Maybe a little application at the end. Now, I was told I'm, I, I don't give enough credit to those intro courses that they apply it many times. And so I'm, I'm inclined to add a few more green boxes, but not that many, probably. Advanced level dissertation research, it's almost all the upper level. And if there's any dipping back down to knowledge and comprehension, usually the student's doing it on his or her own. They figured out something's missing, and they go back down there. So what if we think about it this way and think of sort of overlay the idea of badging on that? And what if we took chunks of the content in those courses and said, this isn't just a course, it's a series of units, series of modules that are these digital badges. And if we did that in our introductory courses and did that in the advanced courses and did that in the dissertation research courses, we put them into badges, we, we uh, put them into an order and say, a course, if you take a course from me, we're going to work on this badge, then that badge, if the badges are, are uh, prerequisite in nature, some are to the others. Then we take all that, and why don't we give that stuff away? Why don't we put that out in this content pool out there and create what I, what I like to call a flex MOOC, right? Why don't we do that and have other people do that and do that from different courses? And there's a whole bunch of things out there that could be called this flex MOOC. And people create a personalized learning plan, right? There are a lot of designers out there who haven't finished programs. There may be some in this room. Very capable designers haven't finished programs. Maybe they didn't figure everything out. They might want to just take pieces of that. Let them do it. Let them select badges, put them in a personalized learning plan,
based on the ones that make sense to them. And then let them work through those badges you know, on their own pace. And uh, they pass a test. That was knowledge and comprehension level stuff, so it can be tested. If you earn the badge, it goes into your online portfolio. This next one, because of the brighter colors, it's more of a higher order thing. So that would have to be peer review rather than assessment. If they pass it, great. They got another badge. Here comes another low level one. Great. Automated, no problem. Test. Oops, problem. Didn't pass the test. Not really a problem. Go look at it a different way. Come back again and pass it the next time. The, thing, the tricky part is if you don't pass one of the higher order ones, then you end up with sort of owing more peer review. If this is going to be free, then before you get your badge, you're going to have to review. If three people reviewed your badge, you're going to have to review three other people's badge. After, you, after you've been certified as, yeah, that was a good performance, now you're capable to do a peer review in my, my way this goes. And then you end up with um, that badge show up in your portfolio. If you, you know, if you fail the first time around, then you're going to owe six reviews because six people reviewed yours before you got through. So anyway, that, that results in an online portfolio that ultimately gets filled with other badges that people earn. They have this online portfolio. Then, how does it connect back to everything else we do? OK, so you can put them in collections, and you can create reports out of that portfolio. You could pass those reports out for prior learning assessment. One of the real problems with prior learning assessments is it's a pain in the butt because I say I require a portfolio, but your portfolio doesn't have the things in it that I want to see. Well, if you if you worked on my badges, you have met my criteria. I have a product there that is the product I'm looking for. So if you want CEUs, I can just say, well, earning each of those badges was worth so much time, and we could issue CEUs pretty easily on that side. If they give us something that's the equivalent of courses, if that the badges in that report are the same as in that course, then they should be able to go ahead and say, I'd like to uh, apply for college credit for that. And again, if it's, you, you get credit by exam or portfolio. If it's knowledge and comprehension level, you do an exam. If you pass the exam, great. If you don't, you try again. Pass it, you go ahead and get credits for what you passed. And those can be partial. It doesn't have to be, everything has to be three credits. If it's a higher order thing, and you need somebody to review your portfolio, then you go through this portfolio review, which would include a Skype-based interview. Right, if this is higher order stuff, I would look at the portfolio you created out there in the peer review piece. So I'd have, I'd have your products and I'd have three other peer reviews to look at. Then I could look at that rather efficiently and then go ahead and do a Skype interview and say, yeah, okay, so that, you've qualified for that and I can issue those credits. Then, you know, those credits translate into, um, they can be used in certificates, they can be used in degrees. And so we use that. We give away free content which does good things for the world. Wouldn't it be great if we did this with instructional design and people all over the world design better training programs and you know, as a result, <coughs> everybody's lifted. But also some percentage of those are going to come through and want formal degrees and they can come to us for that. <coughs> so I think I'm going to stop it there and just say uh, I'm not a fan of the Carnegie unit. It was created back when this was the airplane that was flying when they said this is how we should run our educational system. And this is the fire department that basically blew up and caused most of the fires that took down San Francisco. Uh, even the Carnegie Foundation now is re-addressing whether or not that's misused. It was, the Carnegie unit was designed as a, a unit to tell how many courses a teacher must teach before getting, uh, becoming eligible for the retirement program. There was nothing magic about this is how much learning should be in a box, and yet we're doing everything based on that. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. We're in a very precarious position. Uh, two critical questions. I'll stop. This is how I'll kick it off for discussion. We need to think about what will students need from us in that world. When open online resources are there, when MOOCs are there, when peer review systems, what will they need from us? And we need to think WWRBD. What would Richard Branson do? In other words, what would somebody from outside do? Then, I'm not saying we do what Richard Branson would do, but we need to think about that. We need to try and think like an entrepreneur. He's the guy who did Virgin Airlines, Virgin Records, maybe Virgin University next, I don't know. Uh, Virgin Space, didn't he, what did he do? Anyway, so he, yeah, what would an entrepreneur do if he just, if you could stop and come at it fresh? And that's pretty much my talk, so let's open it for questions. Do I have any, how much time do I have? I have a little time? 
Sorry I talked too long, but questions? Thoughts? There's one back there. Uh, I'm just curious in the modeling. Let me get you a mic. Um, I'm just curious in this model that you're looking at that would differentiate students based on badging, uh, what do you see as the effect on people that have not gone through that badging program? So when you're comparing a new person that has the badging versus an old person that only has access to a traditional resume and transcript, uh, is this something where you're looking at grandfathering them in and going back and redoing it for them? Or are they expected to retest to generate new badges? Or just in general, how would you look at handling that legacy? Yeah, so that's a good question. So at first I thought you were saying if I were a potential employer, I'm looking at somebody with a traditional degree and somebody with, a, with badges. So you can compare those two things, or you can compare somebody with a degree and badges, which is what my graduates I would, will leave with when my program I'm working on gets developed. But what you're saying is, okay, so what if some of my students graduated before I implemented badges? Would I retroactively issue badges, or would I make them earn those badges? That's a tough one. I think I would, I think I would ask them to resubmit stuff, um, but I don't know. I, don't, I haven't really thought about that. That's a great, that's a great question. I would probably cop out and write a letter that they could use instead of that, or write a badge that has a letter behind it that says this, this degree was earned before I itemized everything, but I have reason to believe that what they learned is almost as good as when I re rebuilt it. You know, so, and that leads you to, a badge can be like a, a, a time capsule or, or a, a stake in time. So I could issue a task analysis badge 2015 and then so that if, if things change in that area, I can always issue a 2017. So instead, one person would have the 15, not the 17. That's a really good question. I hadn't thought, hadn't thought about that. I, I will think about that. Send me an email, kpec at PSU, and I'll, I'll give you a, a more thought out answer. Yes. I was thinking about higher ed how higher ed is so specific in terms of requiring people to have degrees to teach. So how long do you think it's going to take for higher ed to catch up to this? Uh, because right now, if you apply for a teaching position, they want a master in the area, in the discipline, and that's what they want. And in most universities, that's, that's what they're looking for. In many cases, actually, a PhD. And that's what they want to see. They want to see the transcript, and they want to see that degree, they want to see badges. So I, I'm just wondering, you know, even these institutions are trying to create badges and, and give them to students. Are they going to follow the same thing to hire teachers? I think it's going to take a long time to get there because we move really slowly. Uh, but I think others may, may leapfrog us. So this is where, so there's an interesting project called Minerva uh, Minerva University or Minerva Schools, if you Google Minerva University. And so they're hiring people with great degrees, with great reputations. But it doesn't mean they have to. So once you've identified what it is students need to know and be able to do, and you've got sort of validation of that from employers, you know, if Boeing says this is a good aerospace certification, if you can accomplish that with somebody who doesn't have the PhD, then, and by the way, there's a lot of people with a PhD who probably couldn't accomplish that because they're not very good at the teaching side. They don't have a teaching badge. Most people who are out there you know, teaching don't have the, any credentials in teaching. But so I think it will, the good news is the evidence is there. And once we start proving that people can do it and measuring well whether they can or can't, then we'll be able to show that it doesn't necessarily take the PhD to teach you know, calculus, for example. Good, another good question. Thank you. Do we have time for another question? There's one over here. Uh, I'll be really loud. So, uh, I'll run over. For a very cogent explanation of badging. I mean, I haven't quite heard it put as clear as, as you put it today, so thank you. And so my next question is, do they ask you at Penn State to do this all over to the faculty? Because I think 
you know, those of us in this room already were meeting you at least halfway, if not more that, than that. Yeah. And I imagine that in dealing with faculty, um, they, a lot of times they get hung up on just the word badge and then their eyes glaze over and they don't hear the rest of us. So do you have any advice for broaching this subject with faculty who don't already sort of think about this on a regular basis and are sort of, you know, just mostly doing the day-to-day -day job of teaching and, and that sort of thing? Yeah. I think, so my advice would be start, and it's back to the CBAM model that they were saying earlier, start with early adopters and the people who are further along the curve. I, I would start with the designers in these different places. So Earth and Mineral Science is going to be doing some badges. Why? Because we've got some really outstanding designers there who get that and who are sort of leading the fight. So start there. Start also with the co-curricular stuff. So another uh, first use of badges at Penn State is going to be our engaged scholarship. We have this movement for engaged scholarship now, where with all these uh, service projects, Students are supposed to develop systems thinking, critical thinking, uh, understanding of diversity and, and uh, global perspectives. So we, we're creating badges for those things. It's not the equivalent of a course, but it's going to be valuable. And people, right now, all that stuff that students do go un, goes undocumented. And they have nothing they can show a potential employer other than talking about it. So start with early adopters and start with co-curricular stuff. and then. When people can see it, I think they'll warm up to it and they'll say, oh, I can do that. Uh, but the scary part is, for a lot of courses, we really haven't identified what those outcomes are. And we don't really, really don't measure them well. So that Carnegie uh, quote, if I had more time and spent, if I budgeted my time better, uh, I could have read to you where they, it's, it's gonna, there's a risk. You know, will higher ed do the work required to identify those competencies well and measure them well? So until that happens, they're probably going to keep the credit hour. You know, that's, that's what it comes down to. All right, I think I need to, uh, need to stop. I'll be here today and most of tomorrow. Um, so if you have any questions, stop me. And, or uh, we may be going out tonight. Maybe I can answer questions at that point. Thank you very much. <laughs>